morning, uh, good morning, uh, dear uh, participants of the uh, launch uh, uh, of the Baltic Yearbook of International Law, a uh, new volume that, uh, uh, among uh, other um, things, uh, had been devoted to uh, a special theme. Uh, on the Baltic states uh, and uh, Russia's war uh, against uh, uh, Ukraine. And today uh, we will um, discuss uh, what uh, the findings of uh, some of the authors uh, that um, have been included into this volume, uh, what these uh, findings uh, have been. But we will also uh, discuss uh, more broadly um, the similarities and the differences of uh, two, uh, I must say, uh, major events in, in international relations and international law um, that have happened uh, well in the in the in the certain period of time, namely. The unlawful occupation of the Baltic states in 1940 by the the, the Soviet um, Union, and uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, Russia's war uh, against uh, uh, Ukraine that um, started with the the occupation of uh, uh, Crimea in 2014, and uh, uh, the the, the full-scale aggression aggression um, that began. Um, practically um, um, two two years ago, uh, within few uh, few days, uh, we will have that uh, that uh, unfortunate um, anniversary. Now uh, today, um, among um, the, the the participants of, of the debate, um, I am happy to to present to you the the rector of the Riga Graduate School of Law where the, the editorial office of the Baltic Yearbook uh, is based, uh, uh, Professor Cernotta. Uh, I am pleased to introduce to you uh, Professor Janis uh, Grasses, uh, Professor of International Law at Riga uh, Stradinsch University, one of the authors uh, of the uh, new volume of the Baltic Yearbook of International Law. I'm happy to introduce to you my colleague uh, at the uh, Riga Graduate School of Law, uh, our lecturer in international law, uh, Eva Miluna, who will, who has been working on the theme of uh, use of force and aggression, and will look at uh, uh, the issue more broadly, as well as uh, our um, editorial uh, uh, manager, uh, Ligita Gjotlere uh, is present, uh, and, and uh, Ligita is uh, uh, the, the chair of our editorial office. So have uh, most likely the pleasure, pleasure to welcome uh, the other editors uh, in chief uh, of the Baltic Yearbook of uh, International Law as uh, uh, the uh, discussion proceeds. Um, now. Um, uh, before we go into uh, the uh, volume um, and uh, um, the uh, order of, uh, of presentations uh, will be the following that uh, I will say a few words uh, on, on, on several international law issues followed by uh, uh, Professor Grasses and, uh, and uh, Eva uh, Miluna. But before I do that, I would like to give the floor to the rector of the Riga Graduate School of Law also to say uh, um, um, a few <laughs> introductory words and, and reflections uh, before we go into, into the volume. Uh, Professor Cernota, please, you have uh, the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. As mentioned, I, I'm Adam Sharnota and I represent uh, RGSL, Real Graduate School of Law, which is proudly hosting the <clears throat> Baltic Yearbook of on International Law. And in my opinion, it expressed actually the research interests of the school, which is mainly in the international law and, the, and European law. And uh, what I want to say main, mainly is my reflection upon the uh, yearbooks now is uh, launching of the 21st volume, but I went through, scan quickly, 
all those 21 vol volumes and I identify, let's say, a few issues which I want to share with you from my perspective. I apologize to you, I am not an international uh, lawyer, I am a socio <coughs> sociolegal scholar, but <coughs> what it struck me actually is that, first of all, it means that <coughs> Baltic Yearbook has a very distinguished editors from three Baltic states, which is, it seems to me, rather unusual in the in the <coughs> world. Then the second is a very good, it means uh, editorial board and extremely uh, good uh, advisory board. And I've got the privilege at least to, to meet with two members of that of that advisory board with uh, James Crawford and uh, John Dugard in, in the past. And uh, now what it seems to me that yearbook has a long history, it's 25 years, 21 years now. And uh, this issue, as was mentioned before by Pro Professor <laughs> The chief editor in chief is a, is devoted to the war against Ukraine from international point of view and also from regional point of view. But in the pipeline is the preparation of the next volume, uh, which will, is going to be devoted to the Lithuanian tradition in international law. Now I identify basically five issues which I want to share with you. Right, the first of all. It means what struck me when I scan quickly these 21 volumes is that the Baltic Yearbook on, on international law is consequently underlying, maybe sounds banal, but it seems to me extremely important principle that law does matter. It is extremely important, especially nowadays, that when is on the one hand, as you know, is a war against Ukraine, something is going in, in Gaza, and uh, at the same time is growing so-called you know, so <clears throat> legal nihilism in the around uh, even legal academia. So your book is stressing from the volume one till volume 21 that law does matter and should matter and should be taken into account. The second issue I want to, to, to share with you is and want to highlight is the voice from the region in the area of international law. It means the yearbook plays crucial role in being the vehicle of international law scholars from our region. International law is not most universalistic, I could say, branch of jurisprudence, but it does not mean that it's developing only in the global centers, that what is going, the experience accumulated in the regions play extremely important role and should be part of international uh, um, league law discourse. And then the next point is, which is from, especially from my point of view, extremely interesting, that it's not a only black letter attitude towards the international law, but is presenting this international law in context, right? In political context and also in the social context, cultural context. And that's something which it seems to me really distinguish the yearbook from the normal, traditional, mainstream type of the international law journals. And uh, now sort of the, again, different approach that I mentioned before, actually, this sort of the external role of the yearbook. It means that, well, spreading the voice experiences from the region. But it seems to me that the yearbook plays also the, another role that is open to the global community, that the, the authors which, who publish in the journals came not only from the region actually, but from around the world. And is playing extremely important role actually for the consolidating the international law scholars community. And last, but probably not list is that the yearbook is open to students of international law from, from around the globe and it should be taken into account. So therefore I see the bright future for the yearbook and uh, I am looking for the discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, many thanks, uh, uh, Professor Charnotta. Uh, indeed, uh, you have uh, uh, described uh, the, the very identity uh, of the of the Baltic Yearbook of International Law very well, and and that is certainly how the three um, uh, editors in chief uh, from the three Baltic states 
uh, have tried to 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 build it. Um, uh, now, um, as concerns volume uh, 21 um, that we are uh, launching uh, today, which which was published um, last year, uh, at the end of uh, last year, and uh, volume 22 is already uh, in the pipeline and, and approaching, uh, and that will be also uh, interdisciplinary and, and quite um, uh, interesting, I believe. Um, but on today's topic, um, I would like uh, to share with you um, the following uh, reflections that uh, might also uh, generate uh, further reactions from my uh, uh, co-speakers in a way, uh, and maybe also the, the other uh, participants. Now, <clears throat> what I find um, uh, striking, uh, if I compare um, the, 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 in fact, uh, the behavior of the Baltic governments uh, when uh, they uh, clearly were threatened by the Soviet Union already in 1939 uh, with the, the, the in, in a way, imposed, I, I should say, uh, bilateral agreements which allowed stationing of the Soviet army bases as to the proportion of the three populations, uh, rather big um, you know, stationing uh, of the Soviet army bases in 39, which clearly led to the ultimatums uh, to the Baltic governments in 1940, in June 1940. And then the reaction of the, of the Baltic governments at that time. Now, and uh, the way uh, uh, the Ukrainian government has um, uh, set out its strategy in countering uh, the Russian uh, aggression. Um, there is a difference already uh, in this context. And I think the difference indeed is Ukraine, uh, as the uh, director just mentioned, also uh, builds its strategy um, uh, along the idea that law matters. And it is therefore that Ukraine um, has uh, uh, put uh, international law um, in the center, in fact, of its strategy. And that you see uh, by uh, uh, the um, uh, initiatives uh, that Ukraine uh, has uh, uh, launched in the context of the United Nations. And so we have uh, very important General Assembly resolutions of uh, uh, the year 2022 in the, in the emergency session uh, on Ukraine. But we also see that uh, already before the full-scale uh, 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 invasion, um, uh, Ukraine uh, went to uh, the International Court of Justice. And the judgment in the first case, uh, uh, Ukraine-Russia, was uh, rendered by the International Court of Justice not so long ago. And the second case uh, of, the international, of, of Ukraine uh, against Russia um, started uh, sort of immediately after uh, the invasion uh, in 2022. And we had on 2nd of February, we had uh, the court's position on preliminary objections uh, by uh, uh, Russian Federation. And then also uh, I can continue, could continue with uh, the other uh, steps uh, taken uh, by Ukraine uh, that explores in fact, all of the possibilities that international law offers today within all possible uh, multilateral contexts that uh, we have uh, developed following World War II. And so that I find uh, um, as a uh, tool, um, a very important, uh, in fact, uh, example uh, in practice that in the view of the Ukrainian government, law matters. But secondly, that since World War II, and evidently since the occupation at that time of the Baltic states by Soviet Russia, international law mechanisms and rules have uh, developed um, uh, despite the uh, Cold War, but especially, especially uh, following the dissolution of uh, the, the 
Soviet Union and the, and the former socialist uh, Federal Republic of Yugoslavia um, uh, in Europe. So um, now looking at uh, the uh, outcome, when uh, these uh, international mechanisms are approached, uh, be it uh, the United Nations, be it uh, the International Court of Justice, uh, there have been voices and the questions have been asked, uh, you know, whether uh, um, these institutions have been able uh, to live up to uh, expectations that derive from the prohibition of use of force um, in the UN Charter, Article 2.4. Have they really delivered, uh, you know, what we would expect uh, should have been countering the uh, 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 such a such a major and obvious violation of the United Nations Charter. So there have has been this question, and maybe you will uh, also have some re uh, uh, reflections. Have the Ukrainian government uh, been right in placing international law uh, in a center of its strategy uh, in its fight uh, for freedom? for its territorial integrity against uh, uh, the uh, aggressor. Now, um, there is a, an evident reason uh, why uh, the Baltic states, uh, as well as Poland, uh, are uh, uh, sort of standing by um, and, and a very, very, very powerful uh, um, uh, um, stay, uh, sort of uh, powerful supporters of uh, Ukraine's choice to use all of the available international law mechanisms uh, also as part of its fight uh, for its rights. So uh, the Baltic states uh, and Poland uh, having had uh, their experience uh, with uh, um, aggress aggression uh, uh, in 39 and, and 40 uh, clearly understand uh, why Ukraine chose to uh, also use uh, international law uh, and 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 the the, the mechanisms uh, available. So um, probably uh, what. Uh, I could speak for the Baltic states, uh, what we experienced in 1940 when uh, there was very little where to turn with our claim that our rights as independent states were violated. There was no multilateral anymore for uh, at that moment to turn to. So we could only hope again to the, 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 the that the Western uh, 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 democracies would uh, support uh, at that moment a very rudimentary international legal order uh, which had been violated against us but it was a very rudimentary and probably a minority believed um, in the vision of the League of Nations at, at, at that time um, uh, before 1939 at least and so this is why the Baltic states are standing by the choices of Ukraine uh, today, uh, because uh, uh, it is, uh, in our view, uh, very clear that um, we have to do our utmost to make the law work. And in this case, that would be also the mechanisms for state responsibility once internationally wrongful act uh, has been um, uh, committed. So, um, I'm sure the, the the speakers will uh, will say uh, a number of things on that, but uh, my own uh, uh, sort of uh, very interim uh, conclusions are uh, the following: that and it, it does transpire from the articles uh, uh, in the book uh, in in many uh, sort of in which treat many aspects related. Uh, to uh, uh, these, the, the comparison uh, between 1940, 2014, and 2022. Uh, my uh, uh, sort of conclusion uh, is the following, that it is very evident 
how much, uh, nevertheless, uh, international law has consolidated and how many mechanisms that can deliver decisions there are compared to that point in the history. And that is the good news. <laughs> that is the good news and the governments are really, uh, I think it is very much about the governments willing, being willing to use what international law offers to counter attacks on the world order. It's, and then, of course, we enter into the domain of politics. Uh, what does the willingness depend on? And, and that's uh, we will probably not discuss that, but uh, but that's uh, that, that that's an issue to to be kept in mind. So what we have is a major decision of the Council of Europe, representing the democratic spirit of Europe, uh, expelling uh, Russian Federation from uh, the membership of the Council of Europe. I think that was a that was a very strong decision. It was uh, a very necessary decision so that uh, Europe could continue respecting itself. And the yearbook uh, uh, carries uh, um, uh, an article by Andrew Jemczewski and Rick Lawson of incredible, incredible depths of analysis what exactly happened in that uh, uh, in, in those few weeks between 24 February 2022 and March, uh, uh, mid of March, when uh, uh, the Russian Federation was expelled and that, that it was expulsion, not the withdrawal of the Russian Federation from the Council of Europe. And what consequences it has on the, juris, uh, uh, on the jurisdiction of the European Court of uh, Human Rights. So it is the, 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 the most, uh, um, I would say, really an article uh, to be read uh, in all of the uh, uh, foreign offices, I should say, uh, certainly of the Council of uh, Europe uh, uh, member states. Now, um, but that is also the strengths where the strengths of multilateralism is, was shown and international law did do its function because that, that's a matter that was an example of responsibility, of enforcement of responsibility when you are expelled from uh, um, an organization that is based on, uh, on respect for peace and, uh, and mutual, uh, mutual trust. Of course, uh, the sanctions of the European Union, uh, I just mentioned them, uh, the, the yearbook uh, uh, as such the, uh, does not uh, carry exactly uh, an article on, on EU sanctions, but the yearbook uh, carries uh, uh, a broader analysis uh, by Professor uh, Vilenas Vadapalas on the use of force and the circumstances excluding responsibility and treats uh, uh, the questions of uh, more general uh, of, of, of countermeasures and uh, the lawfulness of the countermeasures and uh, countermeasures as excluding um, uh, international responsibility, as well as possible arguments invoked uh, that could be invoked by the Russian Federation, um, uh, arguing uh, that uh, they are uh, excluded from state responsibility and actually counters uh, um, uh, these uh, arguments in this article. And so it is also something to be read, uh, evidently, by the, 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 the foreign offices um, across. Now, um, where you see uh, um, the, the pending issues uh, from the occupation of the Baltic states uh, that uh, could not be really conceptualized uh, within the concepts of international law as they were in force at the time these consequences ar ar arose. For example, the whole issue of the partisan fight against the Soviet regime, so-called Forest Brothers, uh, that operated in the Baltic states even up to uh, years 1956-58. Uh, and there has been uh, um, a complicated case law of the European Court of Human Rights um, where I have a descend, I had a descending opinion at that time, um, but uh, 
these issues could not be fully resolved by the existing international law at the time, and they are relevant today. It's very interesting to look at it from the perspective of today's international law, and that is uh, also the uh, uh, article by another scholar, Mate uh, uh, Grossman, uh, that I would like to draw uh, attention to. And of course, the big issue of, uh, of the refugees, of the Ukrainian refugees uh, in uh, all of uh, uh, the Western world, uh, I should say, and, and probably beyond, compared to uh, the Baltic refugees. Uh, during World War II and following World War II, those who managed to escape uh, the, the Soviet uh, occupants. And you see how much uh, the uh, refugee law and uh, um, uh, interim protection uh, possibilities, uh, humanitarian status, how much that has evolved. Um, uh, and the article by uh, Lira uh, Yakulevichiene uh, is extremely in, uh, informative. And so when you look at these articles, uh, in a way, you almost get um, 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 sort of a, a relief that we have been able to come a long way in building international legal order. But of course, now, it is really uh, up to everybody concerned in the respective uh, areas of responsibilities. We as scholars of international law or law more broadly and uh, sort of the governments, uh, those taking day-to-day uh, -day decisions to in fact by, stand by these achievements in the face of in fact the frontal attack on uh, what these achievements uh, of the world represent. It, it is uh, indeed a war, not uh, um, uh, sort of Russia uh, attacking Ukraine. It is actually a war between the values, uh, a different worldview. It is the war between different worldview, um, as, uh, as, as we know. And so, um, uh, yeah. Uh, the, all of these um, um, analyses and the, the reflections are um, available in the new volume of the Baltic uh, Yearbook. Um, I will stop here and I will invite uh, the other uh, participants to um, either present further the findings because uh, I left uh, the article by Professor Grassis to Professor to uh, introduce. Uh, another very interesting take um, on, on uh, especially on what happened to Crimea in comparison to uh, what the Baltic states went through. And, uh, and then uh, uh, my colleague Eva Miluna will also uh, comment more broadly and, and then we uh, op open a, a little debate among all of us. So now, Professor Grassis, uh, please, you, you have the possibility to continue. Good morning. Uh, first of all, thanks to Rector, thanks to Professor Zemel for invitation to be here in this grand opening of uh, uh, Baltic Yearbook International Law. And uh, I'm sure this is the best journal that we have in the region uh, on international law. Uh, also, uh, many thanks to Laura Mielkso, Ineta Zemel, and also Daniel Zalimus as editors of this uh, journal. And also Legate Gertler, who also made a great contribution in, in preparing of this uh, um, issue. And also I see that Dainus Jalimus has joined us. And uh, first of all, Dainus, congratulations with Lithuanian Independence Day. Uh, and now I will start concerning my uh, article. So uh, probably the title of the article is very unusual. Old wine in new bottles. And uh, this is how I try to characterize what is now doing Russia in neighboring countries in comparison to what happened in our uh, history. So it was uh, 10 years ago. It was late February of uh, uh, 2014. More precisely, it was February 27, when uh, strange bands of armed gunmen with no any sense of distinctive emblem, emblem belonging to some army, 
started to appear on the roads of Crimean uh, Peninsula in Ukraine. So later with what we call it usually um, little green man began to seize governmental buildings in, in Crimea. And uh, then shortly afterwards on uh, 16 March of 2014, the people of Crimea participated in illegal referendum and voted overwhelmingly uh, for their region to become part of uh, Russia. Uh, however, legitimate or not, Crimea effectively became part of Russia after these events. Um, was the Russian hybrid war against Ukraine a novelty? No, because we had already similar scenarios, uh, for example, also in Latvia in 1940. When soldiers without any signs of belonging to a particular army attacked Latvian border checkpoint, uh, Mastenki, in the early morning of uh, 15 June of 1940. This scenario resembled that uh, in Crimea 74 years uh, later. A silent occupation of Latvia, new pro Moscow government, illegal elections, and then illegal uh, referendum. After these events, the Soviet Socialist Republic of Latvia voluntarily joined the Soviet Union on uh, 5th of August of 1940. So it means uh, that Russia using the same methods of habit war against the neighboring countries uh, for extending its territory. In practices, cases of Latvia in 1940 and uh, Crimea of uh, uh, 2014 are very similar in a lot of uh, uh, these, uh, nuances. Of course, some nuances are different, but in general, situation and approach by Russia is very um, similar. Um, also, in both cases, there were no declaration of the war. But uh, declaration of war became a gesture of courtesy between states in the First and Second World Wars. For example, in the First World War, uh, so monarchs just sent uh, new to another monarch say, hello, Alexander, I'm starting a wage war against you. So it was a courtesy suggested by states in the First and the Second World Wars. Um, what I have found is that um, British lawyer Morris has uh, investigated uh, wars in uh, Europe and America between uh, 700 and 1870. So at that moment, 107 wars started in territory of Europe and America without declaration of the wars. So it means it was all practice that uh, we could start this war also without any uh, declaration. If you speak about the uh, uh, case of Latvia, so as I mentioned already, then uh, aggression was initially carried out against uh, Latvia. Then we had occupation, which ended with uh, non-recognized incorporation of the state territory into the Soviet uh, Union. And we had this uh, uh, long illegal occupation for 50 years. Uh, so uh, if you speak about this attack uh, on uh, 15 June of 1940, there are some contradictions in documents, whether the soldiers were with some distinctive elements or not. Probably no, uh, because also in this uh, uh, letter report by Latin ambassador Pretty Scott in Moscow, they indicated that simply was armed uh, gunmen without any uh, recognition. Um, then we had this ultimatum of 16 June of 1940, when um, uh, government of the USSR required Latvia to replace the government in order to ensure this uh, mutual assistance pact uh, of 1979 between Latvia and the uh, Soviet Union. Of course, the um, Latvian government took into account what happened in Finland. And probably therefore, Latvian government 
gave it consent under pressure of the threat of use of force. However, this cannot be regarded as legitimate because it was given as a result of possible military uh, threat. So our government, like in uh, Ukraine and in Crimea, gave up without any military resistance. Uh, so later already on June 21, uh, there was uh, formated so-called collaboration government under the leadership of August Kirchenstein. And uh, then next steps were taken uh, towards so-called incorporation of Latvia into the USSR. Um, in order to give impression about the free will of the people to join uh, what they used this term, fraternal Soviet republics in the USSR, elections of Simon was organized on July 4, uh, 1940. Uh, it is uh, clear that elections were participate only one electoral list, so-called Latvian working people list. They gathered almost 100% of all votes in these elections. So it means almost practically all citizens of Latvia voted for uh, submission to the uh, Soviet uh, Union. Or the later, it was August 5 of 1914, the Supreme Council of the USSR adopted the decision to accept the Latvian uh, Soviet Socialist Republic as Soviet Republic into uh, the USSR. And so this process uh, of incorporating of Republic Latvia was done in order to make impression. This was one of the decision by Latvian uh, people. Um, unfortunately, in June of 1940, the Latvian armed forces received no order to resist to the uh, mass entry of Soviet Red Army. Very similar, like also it was in Crimea, when Ukrainian soldiers did not receive uh, order to start resistance in the Crimean uh, Peninsula. If you speak about uh, Crimea case in general, uh, we must remember that in uh, 1994, Russian Federation, United Kingdom, uh, Northern, uh, so then United States, they made this memorandum on security insurances for Ukraine uh, with one aim that uh, Ukraine says goodbye to nuclear weapons. But this country is guaranteed that uh, Ukrainian to be whole country even after this decision by Ukrainians, Ukrainians uh, to say goodbye to uh, nuclear weapons. In that moment also, uh, between two countries, between Russia and Ukraine, it was made treaty on friendship cooperation in uh, year 1997. Uh, Russians have bases in Sevastopol and in other uh, uh, places in uh, Crimea and Peninsula. So also this fleet, uh, this uh, former Soviet fleet was divided between Ukrainian and uh, uh, Russian uh, troops. But still, then starting from uh, 27 February of 2014, armed forces, initially without any uh, distinctiveness uh, emblems, started uh, to take over the Autonomous Republic of Crimea and uh, uh, Sevastopol. Uh, later, when President Putin recognized that um, it was um, soldiers of the uh, Russian army. Um, then during the march, Russian forces seized uh, all Ukrainian bases in Crimea, most of which offered no resistance, uh, unfortunately. And uh, it was interesting that Moscow promised to honor the rank uh, of its Ukrainian soldiers who will start accept uh, Russian citizenship and also to start uh, to serve in uh, uh, Russian army. Then, of course, uh, later on March of 2014, uh, both the Supreme Council of Crimea and the Sevastopol City Council adopted the Declaration of Independence, and uh, which uh, stated also this main intention uh, to join Russian Federation. Um, again, 
a referendum was held. And uh, like in Latvia, uh, approximately 95% voted for uh, participation of Crimea in the Russian uh, Federation. And then the final act, uh, final act uh, by Russian Federation was the decree of President of Russian Federation Vladimir Putin on 17 March of 2014. Uh, by this act, uh, President of uh, Russia recognized Republic of Crimea as federal subject of Russian Federation. And I remember there was a uh, great consensus in the Kremlin uh, with uh, Square uh, celebrating that Crimea has begun again uh, part of uh, uh, Russian uh, Federation. Of course, civilized world, starting from Council of Europe and also United Nations. And so uh, they have never recognized these changes, what happened in Crimea and in Ukraine. And already on uh, 27 March of 2014, General Assembly of the United Nations adopted resolution uh, calling upon states not to recognize these changes in status of the Crimea region. So if I would like to make some summary of this, that um, the cases of Latvia in 1940 and Crimea in 2014 share many similarities. In both cases, there was Russian military aggression using the hybrid war method. The governments were replaced and in both cases, a new sham government organized processes to give this impression that people voluntarily wanted to join the great neighboring uh, country. In the case of Crimea, a referendum was organized, while in case of Latvia, we had uh, parliamentary elections, and this new uh, parliament, which called People uh, Saima, voted for accession of Latvia to the USSR. Uh, some technical details in nuances were different. For example, Latvian army was disbanded after the so-called incorporation of Latvia into the USSR. And the uh, event transformed to some territorial corpus of Red Army. At least part of his soldiers uh, later started to serve in uh, uh, Red Army. Ukrainian army bases were already overtaken before um, Crimea uh, became de facto part of uh, Russian Federation. Uh, but what is common for both cases? Both cases constitute examples of breach of international law in relation to territorial integrity and independence of the state as these uh, uh, state guarantees were guaranteed by international treaties. So therefore, uh, I would, I would like to say at the end that uh, I started to pick up materials for this article already in some year, I think 2008. And then step by step, I went to the conclusion, and especially after events in 2014, that Russians like to use old methods how to integrate neighboring countries in their uh, territory. So step by step, Silent occupation, then some, uh, uh, let's say, attributes of uh, voluntary uh, joining of these territories, and then you're already in a Russian Federation. I hope that both countries has uh, made some conclusions from these cases, and especially Ukrainians. And we see that Ukraine in 2014 and Ukraine in year 2022 are two different states. Eight, eight years later, Ukrainians were prepared to resist to aggressor from the East. And I hope that they will win this war. They must win because they struggle for all democratic world against aggressors from East. Thank you colleagues for attention. If you have some comments, questions, I'm ready to answer. Thank you. 
thanks to uh, Professor Grasses, and uh, this was an extremely interesting uh, comparison and very useful. And on the on the pages of uh, Baltic history that are not very well known uh, in the world. Um, so I, I also will uh, encourage the readers of the Baltic Yearbook uh, to go and to uh, read your article. And now, without further ado, uh, I give the floor for uh, a broader comments on all of these issues to my dear colleague, Eva Miluna. Please, Eva. Thank you, Professor Ziemele, for, for your kind words. I will speak about... Uh, I will speak about the fact how well international law was equipped to address aggression in the year 1940 and 2022. So when Latvia faced Soviet aggression in the year 1940, we had already, the, Latvia was a party to the Kellogg-Briand Pact of the year 1928, which prohibited the resolution of disputes by the means of war. Latvia was also a uh, party to the London Convention of the year 1933 on the crime of aggression, outlawing aggression. And besides that, uh, of course, there was customary international law rules, which prohibited the, the resort to the use of force. However, what happens in the year 2022? Uh, in the General Assembly, uh, in the year 1974 has addressed aggression in a separate General Assembly resolution. It said that aggression is the use of armed force by a state against the sovereignty, territorial integrity, and political independence, or any other manner inconsistent with the char Charter of the United Nations. So that was in the General Assembly resolution, but that resolution also stipulated that General Assembly, sorry, the, the, the Security Council may determine other acts that, that denominate aggression, which was a great uh, difficulty for the International Criminal Court to redefine the resolution in the International Criminal Court statute due to the principle of legality that, that the, the Security Council may address other acts of aggression and stipulate that other acts uh, denominate aggression. And now I, I, I would wish to stress the crucial importance that the International Criminal Court plays nowadays because it, is, it tends to be a universal court uh, which would prosecute individuals for their international crimes. Uh, but for the International Criminal Court's jurisdiction, with regard to the crime of aggression, we need this coexistence of state act of aggression and individual act of aggression. And for state act of aggression, the International Criminal Court's Assembly of States Parties has decided to reproduce the resolution 3314 in the statute of the International Criminal Court to say what are the state act of aggression. So, uh, but with regard to the individual act of aggression, it says that crime of aggression means planning, preparation, initiation, or execution by the person who is a leader and the acts which by its gravity, character, and scale constitutes manifest violation of the United Nations Charter. Some commentators say that this is a very, very high threshold to say that an individual act constitutes by character, gravity and scale constitutes a manifest violation of the charter of the United Nations. However, I would claim that this case with Russia's aggression in Ukraine still would satisfy these criteria to try the highest political and military leaders of Russia for the act of aggression. Of course, the International Criminal Court rests on the principle of complementarity, meaning that it is first national member states that should prosecute individuals for international crimes. And only when they are unable and unwilling, then International Criminal Court step in. 
But we now see that the prosecutor, proprio motto, upon its own initiative, has intervened in the case and issued arrest warrant for President Putin. We will see how it will develop further. But I would say that in principle, uh, this also implicates the role of the UN Security Council, because with regard to the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court, and with, with regard to the state act of aggression, uh, Article 15 bis of the International Criminal Court statute states that in principle, prosecutor needs to ascertain whether there is a prior state act of aggression determined by the United Nations Security Council. Uh, however, if six months after uh, the, uh, the inquiry, this, if six months after the inquiry Security Council does not determine aggression, the prosecutor may proceed. So this, in some uh, commentators, you, this was not a great success uh, achieved by, uh, by the drafters of the crime of aggression. However, the aggression is still there and it, is, it has entered, the definition has entered into force for the parties that have agreed to that. So we have the crime of aggression in the International Criminal Court statute. And I would wish to say a few words about the judgment of Ukraine versus Russia, which came out some two weeks ago. So the, the, International, Crim the International Court of Justice said that in principle, Russia has violated the obligation to investigate terrorism financing under the Terrorism Financing Convention. It has also said that, uh, that Russia has violated the right to education by implementing its educational systems in ethnic Ukrainian uh, schools. And what has to be uh, noticed from this judgment that uh, there was also a stipulation that there are no other violations of terrorism financing convention or racial discrimination convention. However, the president of the court, Judge Donegal, voted against that, implicitly saying that there may be other violations of the terrorism financing convention and racial discrimination convention. But of course, one has to take into account that there may be difficulties with these conventions because uh, Ukraine went with these conventions because they determine mandatory ICJ jurisdiction. So, uh, so this may not be squarely, uh, these conventions may not be squarely enough uh, to address particular violations of war crimes, aggression, and crimes against humanity. The ICJ also said that maintaining the limitations on majorly violated the provisional measures and that Ukraine violated the provisional measures regarding not to aggravate the dispute that exists between the parties. Uh, that is all from my side. So uh, I think that nowadays indeed, international law is well equipped to address the crime of aggression in international law. Thank you so much. Uh, many, uh, many thanks, uh, uh, Eva. Uh, this, this was extremely uh, useful and necessary uh, additions to uh, what we can uh, so far find uh, in the latest volume of the Baltic Yearbook and, uh, and uh, evidently, hopefully, uh, next volumes, in fact, uh, will address uh, in more detail, um, indeed, the ICJ's recent uh, case law uh, in our context, uh, as well as um, the developments, further developments in the International Criminal Court uh, that uh, we have to watch out. Now, um, I suggest that uh, we uh, will go uh, into a debate, but... Um, I am. I do wonder, and indeed, 
um, now I, I too uh, join in Professor Grasses in congratulating our Lithuanian uh, colleagues and scholars uh, with the Independence Day. And in this volume, we have, as I already mentioned, uh, uh, also contributions uh, from two professors uh, uh, in Lithuania. And I see my, uh, my dear uh, co-editor-in-chief, uh, Professor Jalimas, uh, has uh, joined us, um, even though there is, um, um, in Lithuania, I imagine, uh, celebrations. So I do wonder uh, whether Professor Jalimas would also like to say a few words. <laughs> Please. Uh, yes, th th thank you, Ineta. Do you hear me? Uh, everything is okay. Uh, really, uh, f first of all, uh, thank you all for the congratulations. I think it's a little bit symbolic to, to have this event uh, on 16th of February, which is the date of the Lithuanian statehood. Uh, and uh, I, I, I also believe, uh, which is common, uh, also uh, celebration for all of us like uh, we always uh, raise flags of latvia and estonia on uh, their respective independence day uh, so uh, first of all thank you for uh, congratulations uh, and as you can see i am on my way uh, to one of the commemorative events as well uh, so a little bit uh, 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 too much occupation sometimes but um, on the other hand, I, I would like to thank you all uh, for uh, the great honor uh, to be in uh, this excellent team. Uh, really, we have to even to celebrate. I think it's the longest maybe uh, in life uh, journal of uh, Baltic uh, lawyers. It has always been devoted to the topics uh, which are really sensitive and sometimes very painful for us. So uh, a little bit I am going to continue uh, on the subject, uh, which unfortunately I failed last time to submit my publication, but I hope uh, to uh, submit my publication on the same topic uh, to the Lithuanian, uh, or to the volume devoted to the Lithuanian school. That is about uh, effectiveness of international law in the current context of uh, uh, aggressive war against uh, Ukraine. And uh, what uh, I think it's from my, uh, not, not only from my own perspective, but what is really important for the Baltic states to realize. Uh, really, I, I can agree with the uh, majority of the speakers uh, uh, who uh, made uh, presentations before me, but it's uh, international law does have uh, uh, instruments against uh, the war of aggression uh, but uh, where uh, there's one uh, element where i would like a little bit uh, to express my disagreement unfortunately uh, there are still a uh, very big gap in respect namely of the crime of aggression which uh, which can be seen even what uh, from the situation uh, what we have today uh, yes it's it's very uh, and, and of course we should all welcome uh, the decisions or the judgments of the international court of justice but on the other hand they also demonstrate themselves uh, the limitations inherent in international jurisdiction because uh, both of those decisions uh, or judgments, uh, one in, in, in case of uh, regarding uh, anti-terrorist uh, and um, anti-discriminative convention, another one uh, regarding preliminary objections of Russia in the case of genocide. But both of them uh, demonstrates to us that International Court of Justice, I, I think it, it's natural, it's not a criticism to the court as such, but uh, it, it's naturally limited uh, by the consent of, of both parties, and therefore it, it will not uh, deal with the whole complex uh, of uh, aggression. And sometimes uh, I think it's even... Uh, 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 from my own perspective, the result can be even a sort of deplorable uh, because the last uh, judgment, what does it mean? That the court will uh, pronounce uh, on the issue whether uh, Ukraine hasn't committed genocide in the Donbass region. I think the, the, the issue is uh, uh, very clear for all, all of us, uh, but it will not deal with uh, the issue of Russia's responsibility for the possible uh, uh, violations of the, of the Convention of Genocide. 
and uh, that's why I, I really don't see uh, for the future, uh, let's say, very, uh, uh, very uh, remarkable uh, uh, consequences uh, following from that future judgment. But uh, on the other hand, uh, we can speak about the initiative uh, raised uh, a few years ago uh, following the, the start of a large scale invasion and uh, currently supported by some 40 states. So they are in the core group. Uh, that is namely on the establishment of a special tribunal for the crime of aggression. Uh, because really, uh, what can I see if we uh, don't have this tribunal in future, uh, we will be able to speak about international law rather from the theoretical, but not from the practical uh, uh, aspect, uh, because the, the, the crime of crimes, uh, like Nuremberg Tribunal uh, pronounced uh, uh, that it is the, the, the crime which accumulates all the evil contained in uh, all the rest uh, war crimes, um, so it uh, can be left uh, unpunished. Uh, and uh, that is very, uh, that can be very wrong message to uh, all potential uh, violators of uh, international law. Uh, that's why, uh, really, I would like to emphasize the importance of this initiative. And uh, I'm happy, really, that uh, all the Baltic states uh, support this initiative. They are actively participating also in the already established uh, center in The Hague for collecting evidence uh, uh, for investigation of a crime of aggression. Uh, but I would like specifically underline uh, why especially for the Baltic states, uh, this tribunal is uh, very necessary. Of course, it's a, a little bit maybe artificial comparison with the Nuremberg Tribunal, but um, uh, I can recall that, uh, and continuing also one of uh, previous speakers, uh, that uh, we always make uh, comparisons between uh, the current Russia, the current re uh, Russian leadership, and uh, the Nazi Germany leadership, because they actually use the same arguments for justifying aggression against Baltic states or against uh, Ukraine or other uh, countries uh, suffered from uh, Russian aggression. Uh, and uh, why this uh, tribunal is specifically necessary, I mean, a uh, special tribunal for the crime of aggression against Ukraine, is for the same reason, because the uh, Nuremberg Tribunal condemned for all times and a sort of outload uh, the whole system of ideology of Nazism. Uh, here we have already established, very firmly established, uh, ideology of the Russian world or uh, racism. Maybe it's not uh, even be better name, namely racism, because it's really a sort of mixture between, uh, you know, Russian imperialism. Uh, nationalism and uh, Nazi ideology. And we even he heard just recently how uh, Putin uh, tried to justify uh, the invasion of Germany or aggression of Germany against Poland in 1949. Uh, but Poland allegedly uh, were guilty of, of that act of aggression. So uh, really, uh, it uh, makes a lot of sense to uh, seek for condemnation of this ideology of racism in the future tribunal uh, for uh, the aggression against Ukraine, because actually what uh, this ideology, maybe it doesn't seem consistent, it, it even has internal controversies, but uh, it perfectly suits for the country where all the critical thinking is uh, has to be punished. That's uh, we should al also understand. Because on the one hand, it glorifies the Soviet past and of course justified as all the aggression against the Baltic states uh, and other crimes committed uh, against uh, the Baltic population. Uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, it also seems to con condemning Lenin uh, for creating uh, artificial 
as they say, uh, artificial uh, Ukrainian uh, state. Uh, so uh, we should uh, have in mind, uh, however, that uh, not only Ukraine doesn't exist uh, in the framework of this ideology, uh, the Baltic states also doesn't have their right of existence according uh, this ideology. And nobody, I think, uh, currently has any doubt that the next target uh, should be namely the Baltic states, uh, the former Soviet republics, uh, I mean, not the Baltic states, of course, but, uh, but some uh, others who uh, would dare to resist against uh, Russian domination. Uh, so, uh, and uh, they really deny our right to existence the same as they deny uh, the Ukrainian identity. And uh, the last thing I would like also to mention, of course, this ideology is aimed at destruction of all the international legal system. Uh, and uh, it denies international law as such because uh, they, uh, again, uh, invoking the concept that they, if necessary, they can defend their national interests, uh, whether right or wrong, uh, by using force. Uh, but of course, it is also anti-humanistic ideology because uh, it can also resemble a little bit Nazi practices uh, when they, uh, you know, uh, fighting with LGBT people. Currently, you know that the LGBT community, uh, although there is no formal organization in Russia like that, but LGBT community was, uh, uh, how to say, prohibited as such by uh, by uh, so-called judicial authorities of the Russian Federation. So it's also a part of, uh, of this ideology, uh, anti-humanistic direction, uh, denying human uh, being of their dignity and uh, even the right to life. Uh, so that's why very important for the Baltic states, namely to seek uh, the un universal as much as possible, of course, the condemnation of this ideology. And of course, the last thing I, I, I just wanted to say, uh, also, don't forget about our, I wouldn't say colleagues, uh, but uh, what uh, uh, with regard to the crime of aggression, uh, the so-called judges of the Russian Fed uh, Federation Constitutional Court, they also have been involved in five episodes uh, of this uh, aggression because they uh, allowed to annex uh, five parts of the Ukrainian territory. And I think they should also uh, appear in the bench uh, of the future tribunal for the crime of aggression, uh, because uh, it's uh, I think it's a matter of our uh, legal community to preserve our own dignity that uh, those lawyers should be also condemned and uh, sentenced because they perfectly understood what they had been doing. Uh, so uh, that's uh, my uh, remarks. Uh, of course, I uh, would like to. Uh, First of all, uh, share our gratitude for uh, all my congratulations received for, from you. And uh, I would also thank to all of you for all your efforts. And uh, I uh, wish all the success in our future uh, if efforts uh, to maintain the same line, uh, to speak on all the issues, maybe sometimes being even in minority in comparison with the rest of international lawyers, but to speak about uh, the issues sensitive to our statehood, independence, uh, democracy, and human rights. So thank you very much, Aneta. Thank you all uh, for uh, listening to me. Thank you. Uh, many thanks, uh, Dinius, and uh, really I'm, I'm extremely grateful you could uh, join us uh, in this debate. Uh, what you said uh, perfectly uh, complemented uh, what we have uh, started to discussing and, and in fact uh, really showed, um, uh, you know, the way, the way forward. Um, one of the uh, issues that I would like us uh, to discuss uh, indeed concerns uh, the uh, 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 request uh, of Ukraine uh, to uh, and as step, and also a number a community of international lawyers and uh, uh, one of the most uh, uh, um, you know, sort of uh, powerful uh, uh, speakers on behalf of that community of lawyers is uh, Professor Philip Sands, uh, who also was one uh, guest speaker at the RGSL, um, uh, um, sort of uh, in the in the summer school, uh, and the issue concerns uh, the special tribunal uh, for 
uh, the crime of uh, uh, aggression uh, by Russia and, and possibly uh, beyond, uh, certainly as far as reparations for the damage caused uh, to Ukraine in destructing uh, uh, the, the civilian uh, infrastructure, lives and, and environment, uh, etc. And so I would like uh, to discuss uh, um, sort of this effort uh, to uh, put in place uh, the special uh, tribunal as you know, um, uh, there is um, there are uh, there is a group of uh, like-minded uh, states. I think uh, roughly about uh, 37. Uh, but uh, in the uh, democratic world, um, or I should say, uh, in the world uh, that stands by uh, the uh, current uh, world order and there the states may or may not be democratic, but uh, at least there is a respect for the United Nations Charter and, and the order be based uh, in the Charter. Um, uh, however, uh, among the, this group of states, um, the opinion differs uh, on uh, whether or not uh, there should be such a special uh, tribunal. And uh, one of the uh, hesitations uh, that seems to transpire um, in these negotiations, uh, at least something that has uh, um, uh, entered uh, public information space that, uh, that at least I have been able to gather, um, concerns uh, the fact that um, those that hesitate uh, say um, that uh, they are concerned uh, that uh, such a special tribunal would lead to a precedent in international law and that uh, then uh, differently minded states uh, will come together and will uh, set up uh, yet another special tribunal for uh, uh, those uh, countries that maybe invaded Iraq in 2003 uh, or uh, some other uh, parts uh, of the world. And I think uh, this is an extremely important question, uh, whether the argument on precedent um, that can uh, be um, imported to some other uh, episodes of use of force, uh, whether uh, that argument really uh, is has basis uh, in international law, um, or it is, uh, well, as, as everything, uh, a political argument, of course, but um, how how do you see this? I mean, what what is the, the precedent nature um, of this idea of excuse me of, of this idea of a special uh, uh, tribunal? I mean, we really need to answer this question. You see, otherwise um, uh, the governments are are, are stuck, and uh, I'm not sure to what extent uh, there is an exchange between the experts in international law and the and the policy makers i mean how how do you see that what's the right precedent is it the nuremberg um, does it create uh, uh, some uh, unwelcome new practices in international law can we do we compare actually uh, russia's aggression against ukraine with the other episodes of use of force i think that's that's the key can we compare uh, in terms of international law. Anyone would like to uh, to comment on this? Okay, I'll start. Um, I think, of course, it will create precedent. And therefore, uh, some big countries are afraid of it. As you said, some countries also not only Russian. They invade from time to time some countries. And also, some another countries create a tribunal against this country. Uh, of course, I think that we could compare and make parallel be between Hitler and Putin. It's the same. So two evils, 
uh, which have tried to occupy all Europe. Just now, of course, uh, war is only in threat of, of Ukraine. But believe me, if Putin will win Ukraine, he will not stop. So it means war will be also in the uh, Europe. So I think there are two parallels, uh, really, between what we compare Hitler and, and, and Putin. Uh, it, of course, could create um, uh, this president. Uh, what else I could say? Uh, it's very similar, like uh, uh, this issue on confiscating of assets of Russian Central Bank, the same. The same worries, let's say, in Wall Street and other uh, countries, what will happen after this? Uh, that, let's say, people from some specific countries will never invest more in our financial system. So it means it, of course, it will create precedent. And uh, But um, from point of international law, we must make this international tribunal. Uh, just now, I think... Um, I think it's more realistic that we could make this somewhere in Europe, or let's say under the auspice of uh, Council of Europe, maybe, you know. But from point of view of international law, we must do it because if country follows international law, they have not, to, let's say, um, uh, afraid of such new tribunals. But Mr. Putin and all of his politicals uh, around him, also with uh, judges from. Uh, uh, Supreme Court of Russia, they must be taken to tribunal as a good precedent. What happens if you violate international law? And what Russia do in Ukraine, it's incredible. I think it's even worse than Hitler did in the uh, Second World War. This is my opinion. If I may, if I may continue on that, I also agree to that an international tribunal should be set up similar to what has been set up at Nuremberg uh, with regard to uh, Rwanda and Bosnia. So, but in addition, I think that this tribunal needs to be accompanied with a compensation commission equal that was established after Iraq invaded Kuwait. And however, although it has been said that the Nuremberg Tribunal is the victor's justice, it has to be still remembered that the General Assembly approved the Nuremberg principles as binding international uh, law. So I think that uh, this tribunal indeed is timely and now should be considered under the United Nations Charter because it, besides aggression, uh, it is a blatant violation of Article 2.4 of the United Nations Charter, which is a use Kogan's norm, prohibition uh, to resolve conflicts by the use of force. So, and these 141 states that at the General Assembly voted for the resolution, which is a two thirds of the General Assembly, uh, in principle substitutes the right of veto at the paralyzed Security Council. So I think we should go through the United Nations General Assembly uh, to create this, such a kind of tribunal. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. And uh, Professor Chernotta, you also would like to step in. Please do so. Thank you very much. As I mentioned, I'm not an international law lawyer, but I just want to repeat somebody's else argument, right? It means a few months ago, RGLS, RGSL you know, was uh, <clears throat> having a webinar in which the Philip Sands actually spoke about. It was in relation to the, to the Council of Europe. And what I recall, actually, his main argument and the critique of the ICC and the warrant was based on this crime of aggression. I mean, what he claimed, and he was strongly against the, any special tribunal claiming legitimacy issue that the legitimacy plays the a most important part in the contemporary political situation, it means there will be not consensus as such, but minority. Therefore, what I recall from his argumentation was that he claimed ICC 
International Criminal Court should start, should war give warrant on the base on the crime of aggression, when was this combination of the state and also individual, and that will provide enormously big, you know, legitimacy for such, <clears throat> such claim of international community. That's only repetition. If I may also add something, what struck me here as a, again, let me stress, not international law lawyer, but I try to combine something. <clears throat> That uh, I do agree, Miss Fully, that after these speakers, that there is not only the question of law, actually, but is a the battle of two worldviews, right? It means two different. But if we look from the legal point of view of these worldviews, there is a what is the function of law, right? What is the issue inside connected with law? and the role of law in solving the conflicts as such. And uh, let Habermas distinguish two different, let's say, what he called the Janus faces of law. You know, the Janus, this, this Roman god with two faces. And he claimed one was a, one, one face is a, sort of the purely instrumental to colonize what he called life world. And the second is, is empowering, defending the freedom of people. But after listening here to the to the speakers, it seems to me that he missed the third part totally. He missed why the third part? Because what, what Yanis told about here is that, that on the one hand is a role of international law in solving the conflict, but then is also the ex post totally instrumental use of law to provide legitimacy for the for the unlawful use of force. And that's, it seems to me, is a quite important issue that is a, which should be taken into account in discussion. Thank you. Uh, many thanks. Uh, if I can share my, my take uh, on the <clears throat> proposal um, and the, the request of Ukraine, actually, to uh, uh, establish uh, a special uh, uh, tribunal uh, to uh, address uh, the Russia's as state's responsibility, um, because uh, of course um, the the, uh, the the problem with the International Criminal Court um, is a little bit manifold. Um, it is the question of uh, jurisdiction, where uh, uh, Russia has not um, uh, accepted the jurisdiction of the ICC, um, Ukraine has uh, accepted um, uh, sort of um, in, a, in an unusual way uh, through um, its declarations, um, which, which probably would not uh, have the, the full extent uh, of uh, having accepted the jurisdiction and, and one will need to deal with that. And of course, ICC uh, has the competence to um, try um, individuals, if the states have failed to do so, uh, as already mentioned uh, by the by the speakers, so there are um, difficulties with the International Criminal Court. But I agree that uh, International Criminal Court uh, should go uh, ahead with whatever uh, it can do uh, in terms of its uh, competence. Now. I believe that um, the world uh, that supports uh, rules of international law and that shares the world vision as enshrined in the United Nations Charter has no choice but to create special tribunal with the blessing of the General Assembly. It doesn't have to be the UN body like it used to be uh, with the Yugoslav or uh, Rwanda tribunals. It can be um, 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 a resolution supporting uh, the initiative uh, and already such a resolution would give the necessary legitimacy. But the point uh, that I would like to emphasize is we have really no choice. And I think those states who would, for whatever reason, typically, uh, uh, as Jan has said, the big states, but who, for whatever reason, have resorted uh, to use of uh, armed force. Uh, typically, if you look at those uh, instances, at least the last ones uh, following the fall of Berlin Wall, 
you would see that um, there have been either uh, the reason of self-defense or there has been uh, an attempt to uh, receive UN Security Council validation or support uh, of that. So uh, there are many, many details, uh, important details that distinguish, as Eva very rightly described, uh, the crime uh, that Russia has committed and is committing. Such a crime reaches that high threshold and it is a very high threshold, and we all see in a way prima facie that that threshold has been reached. While in the other cases, I have serious questions whether that threshold uh, of the crime of aggression is reached. And that's what distinguishes the, 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 the current war we are in with what we have had uh, uh, the military interventions before. So that's already one thing that I would like to absolutely emphasize. And on the basis of that, the negotiations have to be uh, uh, led further. But why do I say that we have uh, no choice uh, but to create? And uh, the bigger actors, although with one vote, anyhow, <laughs> like smaller actors, have no choice but to create the special tribunal with indeed the, 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 the claims commission, uh, sort of the compensation mechanism uh, as uh, uh, following the, the uh, Iraq invasion in Kuwait. And that is, uh, if we uh, have conceptualized uh, this crisis in terms of existing international law, and everybody has done so, even those who have voted against at, at, at occasions in General Assembly, we still conceptualize what is going on around us in terms of the Charter, in terms of the genocide, the prohibition of genocide convention, in terms of uh, the other relevant uh, conventions. Now, if we truly believe in our own uh, concepts and rules, then we can't say we should not have a mechanism to enforce those rules. You know, we, we come, the, the, we are on a defensive side, I'm sorry to say right now, uh, representing that uh, world vision and saying we can't have a special tribunal because of someone sometime, you know, before has done something, in fact, would mean that uh, uh, Russian Federation has succeeded in kidnapping from within these, these very same rules we are trying right now to defend. And unfortunately, uh, uh, indeed, as, as uh, both professors have mentioned, um, uh, the, the, the history of the Russian world is they absolutely uh, uh, outsmart uh, certainly the Western world in how they uh, steal from within the ideas that have come that have been created within the democratic world. And international law uh, is one of those major ideas of the of the of the Western world uh, to, for the benefit of everybody. And uh, uh, with, by, by feeling ourselves that we cannot explore all of the uh, mechanisms proposed by international uh, law thinking, we actually give in to uh, uh, this uh, uh, incredible facility with which uh, uh, Russian Federation uh, um, undermines and, and steals uh, our, in a way, our world worldview. And that is the risk, that is the main risk, and that's why I really do not see any other alternative but uh, the special tribunal. Even though uh, it will be subsequently claimed that there is a need for some other special tribunal, etc., etc., but, you know, it, it, one, it's not comparable whatever can be claimed subsequently, whatever uh, investments we may miss using the other um, uh, example, if we do not, in the face of 
the acts that reach that high threshold. I think that's that, that, that was truly a very important point. They reach that high threshold and you have to have the counter uh, measures have to be matching that high threshold. Um, and, and that, I must say, that is, uh, of course, the, the responsibility and there I join uh, Professor Jalimus. It is really a responsibility of the of the Baltic states uh, to explain and deliver this message. Um, so um, hopefully, maybe <coughs> we are also being followed uh, in in our debate. Now that that is my take uh, on the on the special tribunal. I really think we have no choice, uh, and I do not see the negotiation should be about the technicalities of it but not on the idea of it. Um, now, uh, anyone else would like to uh, uh, add something on uh, this uh, um, need to uh, create uh, the special uh, tribunal? Or uh, if we have uh, exhausted uh, the topic, the question of uh, special tribunal, then um, I will offer uh, a possibility, well, if there are of our registered uh, participants, there is a possibility for you too to ask a question uh, to the speakers uh, if you wish so. But then we would need to see the, the, the hands uh, you can use probably or uh, in the chat room to announce your interest or in the chat room you can also send uh, your question. Uh, while uh, the other uh, registered participants uh, uh, do so, uh, I would have maybe another um, uh, round uh, among uh, the speakers. If you would like to uh, follow up uh, on uh, something that has, uh, that has been uh, mentioned uh, by each other, uh, you are very welcome, you know, to uh, switch uh, on your uh, microphone and add uh, some afterthoughts uh, that uh, you would like to uh, to to add. Um, you're very very welcome. Um, anybody, uh, Eva or or Yanis, any any afterthoughts that you would have? Uh, yes, uh, I think that uh, I very much uh, uh, would like to stress what Professor Ziemle said about that international law that plays a role in Ukraine's defending of its legal interests. Because I think that Ukraine is on the right path that it uses each and every opportunity, even if it is terrorism financing convention, even if it is racial discrimination convention. These are the right steps that at, at, at the international level we currently have and the Ukraine uses. It is also interesting how uh, the International Criminal Court will deal with the immunities with the Russian officials. And, uh, but still there is a huge work also being carried also not only on the part of International Criminal Court, but also the European Union, which is gathering research on the uh, military and political leadership and the legislation that currently exists uh, in the Russian Federation. So in principle, uh, it is the right path to, to use each and every opportunity to bring the perpetrators uh, to justice for these grave crimes uh, of aggression and uh, crimes against humanity, as well as war crimes. Thank you. I will just add a few words. Um, former Estonian president, Leonard Mary, has said that uh, international law, it is atomic bomb of the small countries. And uh, I think that um what also Eva said, Ukrainians are very active in, pro in protecting their international rights or international law in international arena. Uh, let's say starting from uh, let's say Professor uh, Alexander Mereshko, who put in doubts about this um, uh, Russian federation rights to be instead of Soviet Union 
in Security Council, for example, and so on. So, so I realize that Ukrainian lawyers are very proactive in protecting their interests, uh, starting from International Court of Justice, also in um, Council of Europe, and so on. So, so for us, for small countries, it's really atomic bomb in our hands. How to protect our interests? The same relates also to events of 1940. Only international law protects us. It's clear that our army was not able to protect us. But let's say also for future, we still have its roots into international law and it really help us in uh, protecting our sovereignty. Uh, thank you. Yes, yes. The the placing international law in in the center of of their strategy um, uh, th that actually helps uh, everybody. I must say the world order uh, and and Ukraine, and that's extremely um, uh, clever, courageous, and and everything else. I see one of the one of the uh, participants, uh, Mr. Aldis Alex, would like to. Um, uh, to ask, I uh, imagine, a, a question. Uh, Aldis, please, you, you, you can do so. Oh, thank you very much. <clears throat> it's nice to see you. Uh, you don't see me, I guess. Uh, That's okay. We can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> You've seen me before. <laughs> mm. Okay. Uh, it's much easier for me to talk. Uh, my question is, uh, you are, I'd like to describe you are all like uh, our Latvian, I don't see any Estonian or, or Lithuanian left on the screen at least, but uh, you are our, let's say, Baltic ambassadors in the uh, whole world of the public international law. Uh, in it, uh, you have had a separate or what's the, uh, what's the right term, distinct uh, opinion in one of the cases of the European Court of Human Rights and uh, I remember um, I talked uh, to Mr. Andris Pierbaux. He was uh, quite uh, highly ranked among the EU officials. And he told me uh, it was all, uh, already after uh, he returned from, the Brussels, from Brussels to Latvia. Uh, and uh, he said his voice was uh, meaningless. His voice was not heard. And uh, my uh, point is that... Uh, uh, in it, uh, you as a former um, judge of the one European court and the current uh, judge of the other European wide court, uh, do you see, do you notice, do you feel our voices heard and uh, recognized and taken, uh, taken into account at least uh, on the EU level and maybe even in the wider level? level? That's my question in short. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks. Uh, of course, the question is uh, very much related to what we are discussing, because we are discussing uh, the uh, uh, importance of uh, um, the international, standing by international law now in the current context, uh, the importance for the Baltic states as well, and all of the, the sort of smaller and medium size, uh, indeed, uh, 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 states, as uh, uh, late President Mary said, and, and Jan is uh, reminded us, international law is extremely important uh, for us. And therefore, the question is, but are we hurt? Because, uh, as everybody has mentioned, the Baltic states uh, uh, indeed, uh, support uh, the strategy uh, of uh, of Ukraine in its uh, fight uh, for its its independence and territorial integrity, uh, which should have been uh, obvious, but unfortunately, uh, uh, it isn't. Now, uh, what I see um, is uh, an interesting phenomena that uh, following uh, Russia's uh, attack uh, on Ukraine, uh, what uh, the Baltic states uh, finally, uh, finally what we have been saying for a very long time, um, started to uh, receive more and more attention, yes. Um, it's been difficult, I know I can share, it's been difficult 
in the late 90s and the early 2000. Uh, for us to uh, explain uh, our history, our legal claims and, and what uh, Professor Grasses has told and has written is therefore very important. These comparisons that we are discussing today are still very important and yes, uh, in my both in my academic career and in my professional career, uh, explaining uh, uh, the uh, Baltic occupation, the consequences of the occupation, how the occupation should have been dealt with in the 90s, but probably wasn't uh, in terms of international law, and we are still paying the consequences. It's been difficult to uh, get across uh, this message. But now, unfortunately, I must say, uh, uh, Russia has helped uh, the Baltic states uh, also in that our voice is finally heard. Uh, it's it's uh, interesting, these, these paradoxes of, uh, of life, and we have seen that also in the recent case law of the European Court of Human Rights, uh, that uh, in the in the the the, 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 the follow-up case of sorts uh, compared to the case where I had my dissenting opinion, and in that case, uh, taking the context uh, uh, into account uh, with the systemic interpretation of the convention, the court arrived at uh, a different conclusion than in two thousand and nine. Um, uh, so, in, in a way, um, how shall I say, um, you know, I understand all of that. Um, it is not always easy to understand each case, each case in international law. Uh, we do not know each other's histories. We do not know, uh, you know, really what is going on in the country. So I do not uh, say that um, anybody in particular was wrong, <laughs> you know, in the previous judgments or the, or the new judgments. It, it's simply uh, what it says is that the law is there. You have to keep going. You have to keep arguing your case and you have to keep uh, explaining it. And this is where I uh, come back to Professor Jalima's point on the recent uh, judgment of the International Court of Justice and also on the, the decision on preliminary objections. Because I saw that uh, in comments, uh, in, in, in Latvia at least, but also internationally, uh, there have been commentators who have said that uh, these are bad uh, decisions, uh, you know, uh, for Ukraine. I disagree with that. I respectfully disagree with that because uh, indeed, as Professor Jalima said, every court uh, has the limits of its competence to begin with, and it is that much that the court can do. Every court is limited by its previous uh, case law because the authority of the, of, the, of the court is based on respecting its case law. And every court would always also think about the enforcement of its judgments. And as far as International Criminal uh, Court of Justice is concerned, the enfo enforcement is done by the UN Security Council. And it is not in the interest of the court if the judgments will not never be implemented uh, because they are against uh, one of the uh, permanent members. So the court typically has to take all of that into consideration. And so um, I uh, would say, and that was uh, the point I wanted to, dis if, if we, we could maybe touch base, I would like to uh, uh, go uh, and, and address a little bit uh, the recent uh, uh, decisions of the International Court of Justice in the first case on the financing, on the Convention Against Financing Terrorism and the Convention Against Racial Discrimination, where we have a judgment, indeed, and the uh, uh, other case based uh, on the Convention uh, Against uh, Genocide, uh, which uh, Ukraine uh, brought uh, against Russia. And these cases, uh, uh, as I said, um, these decisions have uh, generated um, quite, quite a comments uh, almost going to saying uh, that Ukraine lost. Uh, my take is uh, no. Um, uh, the, in fact, uh, in the first case, 
I am uh, myself uh, impressed with the judgment uh, of uh, the International uh, Court of Justice. Uh, the reason is the following. You will remember that in the previous cases uh, on the Convention Against Racial Discrimination, the court uh, has taken a very careful approach. The court has always emphasized that the first remedy to be exhausted is the Committee on the Racial Discrimination. Now, uh, what we have in this case is uh, that uh, the court, uh, in fact, went for the application of this convention and did find a violation. So measured against um, a very uh, uh, careful use of CERD uh, until recently, I thought uh, that was a very important step. Now, similarly, uh, the uh, Convention Against um, Financing of um, Terrorism, uh, when uh, uh, the proceedings were brought, I must say I was particularly skeptical. <laughs> I was very skeptical, skeptical myself on the chances of that case right at the beginning. And it is uh, therefore that finding two very important uh, violations to me is in fact a success uh, of Ukraine because it is not on how many counts that you find, but it is on what issue and that there has been an issue and that there is uh, a violation. Of course, the question is, uh, arises, how do you then uh, implement uh, even uh, the two uh, findings of violation? So uh, that, that is my, uh, my take on the, on the, on the first uh, judgment. And I thought that was very, very, very carefully uh, uh, studied uh, by the International Court of, of Justice. So um, on, on the, on the uh, preliminary uh, objections, uh, altogether mm, that case brought by Ukraine is extremely complicated. Uh, it is, has never ever uh, the Convention Against Genocide has been invoked from such an angle, ever. Even to think about this angle uh, is, uh, uh, you know, to, to come to think about the angle that uh, Ukraine found uh, is, is genius uh, in many ways. And the case is proceeding. And to me, uh, uh, that is uh, a, a first, uh, already a, 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 a win uh, for Ukraine. So there is a legal issue. So that is the most important. There is a legal issue. And why? Because that case, the way it plays out, what it shows is, uh, what I emphasized before, uh, it is not easy for international courts and institutions to deal with uh, uh, Russia's facility to twist international law. And the second case is really in the middle of this facility to twist international law. And how do you sort of decipher that incredible plot that uh, is used uh, by Russian Federation when they invaded Ukraine. How do you uh, sort of straighten it out? That is truly not evident. We know that in Baltic states, but trust me, outside the Baltic states, uh, that's when uh, 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 these completely turned upside down international law, uh, which is how Russia functions, be it human rights uh, narratives that it puts forward with regard to the Baltic states and especially Latvia, be it international law now with regard to Ukraine. For the rest of the world, um, uh, I mean, that's such a twisted mind uh, is, is, is a challenge, you see. And so it is therefore that's, uh, that I find the way the cases proceed, the International Court of Justice does it very carefully, in, in, a, in a great detail and uh, with the view of, uh, you know, uh, keeping uh, uh, the, the, the authority and trust uh, in its uh, judgment as, uh, as uh, evident, uh, um, not only priority, but a, mat a value uh, a matter. So that's how I see it. Uh, and it is by far more complicated 
than uh, so far presented uh, in the public uh, uh, debate. So I wonder, dear colleagues, while we have a few mi minutes left, would you like to maybe share your uh, uh, reflections on, on, the on these proceedings in the International Court of Justice? Question from uh, Savannah. Yes, Yanni, please. So, um, a question is: What impact could be could uh, this have on both the practice of democracy around the world and its theoretical underpinnings in the international legal framework? So, uh, as we said before, uh, this struggle over the values, values of the Western world and uh, what we have in the, I don't say this Eastern world, but okay, just thinking about this by Russian Federation. And uh, of course, um, uh, when we look now to this conflict, we see that uh, for Western world, it's much, much harder to adopt decisions. Also, how to uh, remake your economy for the war, you know? For uh, total totalitarian country, it's much easier to persuade people to go to fight and also to change economy. And I think that just now Russia has full uh, war economy and they could produce, let's say, weapons, what they did and so on. So. Uh, and uh, we must hope that really Western world and nuclear will win because otherwise all values what we have here in Europe, in the world, in Western world, will be changed. So therefore we must change our uh, opinions how to help Ukraine and uh, this help need to be more and more in comparison to what we have in previous two years. Uh, otherwise, all concept also of the international law will be changed in the future. This is my opinion. Eva, would you like to also uh, respond to that question or it's fine? It is fine, yeah. All right. Um, yes, uh, so here, uh, since we have just a few minutes uh, left, uh, I will uh, try to, to uh, round up. First of all, um, I would like to really uh, extend uh, my, my great appreciation uh, to the contributors of the uh, volume 21 of the Baltic Year Book of International Law that you see here. Um, uh, just to inform you that uh, we have special theme indeed, uh, because we organized after the war started, we organized immediately a seminar in September 2022. And the results of that seminar are published in the form of uh, papers in the yearbook. But the yearbook has published, always does, also other submissions that pass the peer review. And uh, in volume 21, I find uh, uh, that uh, the two articles we have accepted are extremely uh, interesting and useful. For example, the Soviet view on democracy and international law by uh, Sevana Pogoshyan is also published. And I found that article uh, extremely uh, useful and interesting and actually links into our discussion and the question asked. So um, moreover, uh, each volume carries um, um, a presentation of recent state practice of the three Baltic states in international law. And for example, in state practice reports, because that's the source of customary international law, and that's the contribution of the Baltic states to the formation and consolidation of international law. And that's why you always will have state reports and uh, in her young years, for example, Eva Miljona was, uh, was working on the Latvian <laughs> state report. Now, um, in this volume, you will find uh, a reflection, among others, of Latvia's position on uh, uh, Armenian, uh, on, on, on genocide committed against Armenians. 
um, uh, for example, the Latvian parliament has taken a, a certain position. You will also find an interesting information of what has happened, for example, following the Court of Justice judgment uh, in Acmea uh, with bilateral treaties uh, that Lithuania was party to on the uh, uh, dispute settlement uh, in international um, uh, investment um, uh, disputes. So uh, I invite uh, all of those uh, interested in international law, of course, to follow also uh, what uh, practice uh, the Baltic states uh, encourage or, or, or follow. Moreover, uh, the, the, you, I invite you to follow information on calls uh, for papers for the uh, future volumes of the Baltic Yearbook of International Law. The one underway, uh, as Professor Jalim has already uh, mentioned, uh, the, the, uh, the one in, in preparation. From time to time, we also flash uh, the traditions in each uh, of the Baltic states. And this, uh, a volume will be devoted, uh, the volume uh, 23 will be devoted to Lithuanian tradition in international law, in practice and research of international law. So you may want to uh, watch out for it or even send in contributions for those in the broader world uh, that are of maybe Lithuanian origin or have been interested in that. Because of course, uh, the histories of the three Baltic states are different and uh, there are differences also in international law issues uh, that arise. Now, that is uh, uh, summing up as far as uh, the Baltic Yearbook uh, is concerned, editorial office with Ligita Giotler in charge is uh, open and, and ready to receive your contributions. And you can always go to the website of the Riga Graduate School of Law and look under research uh, for, for further uh, information. But also you may find uh, relevant information uh, with, uh, with, uh, with Tartu University and also with uh, Kaunas University, where the other two editors-in-chief, uh, Lauri Malkso and uh, Daniel Jalimus, uh, are based. Um, my final uh, uh, sentence on the substance of, of uh, uh, our uh, discussion today uh, is uh, the following. Um, I uh, uh, really agree with uh, all of those who uh, could not emphasize more uh, and uh, say that we need to uh, uh, support uh, Ukraine um, till uh, uh, Ukraine's uh, victory. On the, of course, the victory first and foremost is made uh, on the military side. And I do hope that those maybe who followed our discussion on international relevant international law have realized that uh, Ukraine really needs uh, to have enough uh, support militarily so that uh, it can uh, uh, counter uh, the aggressor and free the occupied uh, territories. So it is the military uh, front uh, that, as we speak, uh, will make uh, a difference. And I do hope that uh, the world understands. If we want to live in peace, that's uh, where the peace is going to be made. That is uh, if uh, Ukraine uh, wins. And I would like to uh, emphasize that. And that's when we will have the law-based uh, world order among all of the nations and the states um, in the world. Um, now with that, uh, I'm happy to close the substantive part of the seminar. I wonder whether the uh, rector of the RGSL would like to say then the very final word. And I thank you, all of the contributors and all of the uh, speakers uh, today. Thank you. What? Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for the fantastic discussion, it seems to me, and uh, for all people involved in preparation of the, the yearbook. And uh, good luck to everybody, and especially to the, to the Baltic Yearbook of, on international law. Thank you.